bringing to life the souls of the past that until now have been lost to history. Talking Heart Island is a half-hour weekly podcast that explores the history of Heart Island, America's largest mass graveyard. Heart Island has been used as New York City's Potter's Field since 1869. It is estimated there are over one million people buried there. Because of recent advances in DNA and fingerprint technology, the identities of some of these previously forgotten and anonymous people have been revealed. The results are truly shocking. Talking Heart Island will interview a special guest each week, selected from an extraordinary assembly of scholars, authors, and scientists in the fields of history, law, medicine, and the arts, as we unravel a secret kept hidden for 150 years. So welcome to Talking Heart Island. And now, here is our host, investigative history writer Michael T. Keene. Thank you very much, Norma Jean. And this is Michael Keene, and we are Talking Heart Island. One quick thing before we begin. We've been asked, how can you pick up a signed copy of our book, New York City's Heart Island, The Cemetery of Strangers, and our audio book narrated by Norma Jean. And you may do so by simply logging on to our website, michaeltkeen.com. Before there was a Heart Island, in fact, before there was a New York City, there was New Netherland. This history is brought to life in Russell Shorto's book, The Island at the Center of the World, the epic story of Dutch Manhattan and the forgotten colony that shaped America. The New York Times said of The Island at the Center of the World, a book that will permanently alter the way we regard our collective past. And the Wall Street Journal called it a masterpiece of storytelling and first-rate intellectual history. Russell Shorto is an American author and journalist. He's a graduate of George Washington University. He's the author of several books, including Amsterdam, A History of the World's Most Liberal City, which hopefully we can get into a little bit uh, today, and Revolutionary Song, A Story of American Freedom, and, of course, The Island at the Center of the World, and Mr. Shorto is with us today. And uh, Russell, thank you very much uh, for appearing on Talking Heart Island. How are you? Well, Mike, thank you very much for inviting me. Well, uh, we're, we're pleased to have you. Um, you know, as I sent you an email, I believe yesterday, uh, as I was told, the best place to begin is uh, usually at the beginning. Uh, why this book? Um, well, it's, uh, I was at the time uh, living in New York, and um, like all journalists, you're kind of always looking for stories, and um, I um, discovered that I was kind of walking on this enormous uh, story that was largely unknown, and that was Manhattan itself, how it came to be. Um, I was living in the East Village. And my daughter at the time was a toddler, and I would the nearest open space I could take her to was the churchyard of St. Mark's in the Bowery, which was built on the site of uh, Peter Stuyvesant's family chapel in the 1600s. And there's a plaque. He's buried in the church, uh, in the wall of the church there. And there's a plaque uh, which has several errors on it about, about him, I, I later learned. But that got me thinking about the Dutch beginnings of New York. And as a writer, I tend to be interested in trying to get back to the beginnings and the roots of things. And I was kind of impressed by my own ignorance of New York's roots. So I started talking to people. I talked to some people, to friends who are historians of New York. And I was then surprised at their lack of knowledge about the Dutch period. And then I realized over time that that in fact uh, historians have kind of walled off that period 
And that intrigued me more. And then eventually somebody said, well, if you really want to know, there's this guy in Albany who's been working since the 1970s on exactly that. So eventually then I looked up Charles Gehring, who is still at it. He just turned 80. So he's been and he's been at it since 1974, translating and publishing the records, the archives of the Dutch colony of New Netherland. And after I spent some time with him, I thought, this is such a great story. And he and his colleague, Yanni Venema, they have been working in the um, State Library in Albany. And they made uh, workspace available for me next to them. And uh, I spent years then working with them. They helped me to, to kind of decipher 17th century Dutch handwriting. And eventually I just entered into that world. The uh, we talked about this uh, offline, so to speak, that and you had brought it up that even scholars of this period didn't study the Dutch. Why is that? Do you think? What, why did they gloss over this? Um, you know, they, there's the old saw that history is written by the winners, and we have, as Americans, we uh, the, the the English beat the Dutch. They took over the Dutch colony. Uh, the English were in New England and in Virginia at the time, and in Europe. England and the, the Dutch Republic were these rivals. And so we, I think, still in many ways look at the world through English eyes. And we look at early American history through English eyes. We assume we, we talk about the 13 original colonies. Well, New Netherland predates those 13 original colonies. Um, so I think uh, people just inherited that. And then you have the added level of difficulty that the records are in another language. So, you know, that's, that's an, a troublesome hurdle to have to deal with. So for all these reasons, it kind of became convenient to just think of New York's history as beginning in 1664 when the English take over and they name the place New York. Why did the Dutch come to the Americas? They, um, well, it, the I guess the, the really broad and kind of glib answer is that it was a fashion among Europeans to be colonizing, to be, you know, setting up North American colonies. Uh, in particular, um, they, it was a good base uh, for uh, exploiting certain products. And in particular, they had their eyes on furs and in particular, the beaver pelt, beaver fur. And uh, they were farming and growing tobacco. And also, the whole period, much of the, the 1600s, the Dutch provinces were fighting a war of independence against Spain, the Spanish Empire. Spain had, in the previous century, colonized South America and Central America. And the Dutch were then, they thought if they had a piece of North America with this you know, magnificent harbor and this island in the center of it, then that would be a base from which to carry out raids against the Spanish in the Caribbean. And they did that, in fact. And that, in fact, is how the first slaves arrived in, in New Amsterdam. They hauled captured Spanish ships into Manhattan, and on those ships were enslaved Africans. And that's how they started. That's how the West India Company, which is the, the Dutch enterprise that founded the colony, started to think, maybe we can make money off of this, too. Can you uh, explain a little bit more what the Dutch West India Company was all about? Yeah, it was about um, the Dutch um, pioneered a lot of the features of modern capitalism, and they did it right at this time period, right when they were uh, founding this colony. Uh, they created the concept of shares of stock, of a stock market and of the modern corporation. And the first modern corporation was the Dutch East India Company, which uh, the East Indies meant Asia to them. And uh, the East Indies was uh, the place that you went to get um, luxury goods and, and spices and things that were highly valuable. And the Dutch kind of cornered the market on those. And that in, is what the Dutch East India Company is what fueled the uh, the golden age, you know, when the Dutch rose to, to prominence and they could, all this wealth came flooding in. And then on the heels of that, they uh, began all these other innovations, which would spread throughout Europe in, in, in art and in, in science and publishing. And uh, 
Then they thought, all right, that's working so well with the East Indies. Let's found a Dutch West India company and do the same thing with the West Indies. The West Indies to them was that meant, I mean, if you're in Europe and you to your left, everything to your left basically was the West Indies. So coastal North America and the Caribbean and South America. So that was the terrain. That was the territory of the Dutch West India Company to exploit, to to battle the Spanish and to get whatever they whatever goods they could get out of that very vast territory. It's my understanding that the Dutch West India Company hired a fellow by the name of Henry Hudson to go on a little exploration. Can you talk about Henry Hudson and what he did? Yeah, it was actually before the West India Company existed, the East India Company, which, as I said, was uh, you know, they were all about Asia. And, and what everyone wanted to do was to get a to find a short route to Asia because, uh, you know, you sent ships there and ships back and that took two years or more. Uh, so everyone knew that there's there was this enormous potential for profit, but it was a huge investment, a huge uh lag in time and hugely dangerous because you know odds are a lot of the ships weren't going to make it back so they they believed there must be a short route to asia and they uh hired this english captain henry hudson who had sailed a number of voyages on behalf of an english company that was called the muscovy company uh and it was called that because they their business was um get uh, furs in russia and uh, for reasons we don't know, they dropped Henry Hudson. They they fired him. He was a very uh, kind of stubborn guy, so it may have had something to do with that. And um, the East India Company, the Dutch heard about it, so the Dutch ambassador in London kind of knocks shows on shows up on his doorstep and says, "Will you come to Amsterdam and meet with my bosses?" So he does. He goes to Amsterdam and meets with the heads of the Dutch East India Company, and they end up hiring him not to do what history remembers him for, which was to chart the the region of, that would be the future of New York, but to find a short route to Asia. They wanted him to go northeast around Russia. He had tried that before. He got locked in the ice. He knew it would be a bad idea, but he, they apparently that they were insistent that that's what he should do. So this voyage in 1609 he try he first tries that decides okay this doesn't work so now i'm going to do what i wanted to do to begin with so he convinces his crew in mid ocean we're going to we're going to take a new uh uh path here we're going to go across the atlantic ocean in this tiny wooden vessel about 18 people and we're going to find what i think is the route which is through the north american continent which on the face of it seems insane to us. His thinking, the, the, the logic of the time was that the world, it was, um, they're, they're, they were still um, basing their idea of the size of the globe on the calculations of the Roman geographer Ptolemy, who was a very good mathematician, but he had miscalculated and he thought, and therefore they thought that the world was about a third smaller than it actually is. And therefore, the part that they didn't know anything about, basically the western half of North America and a chunk of the Pacific, they just assumed didn't exist. So the idea was you could find a channel that went west through North America. And instead of coming to, say, Ohio or somewhere, you would be at the Sea of Japan and you would be on the doorstep of riches. So that was his logic. And that's what he was doing. He went along the East Coast looking for this channel and when he came to what became known as the hudson river it's an estuary it's it's salty so he thought aha channel this is the channel uh, it, so he followed it north and assuming that it would then cut west and it didn't uh so eventually he turned around and went back home but uh on the and so as far as he was concerned he was a failure but because he had charted these regions the Dutch said, some people in the Netherlands said, you know what, maybe North America isn't just an obstacle between us and Asia. Maybe it in itself is a thing of value. I understand that things did not turn out well for Henry Hudson. Can you tell us yeah, what he, happened? He, uh, 
um, that voyage uh, incited a lot of controversy uh, in England because he had sailed for the Dutch, who were the enemies of the English, and it made the English kind of take new uh, appreciation of him. So a group of investors hired him again, English investors, and they said, all right, you think you – he still thought there was such a thing as a Northwest Passage. In fact, there is, but – it was impossible then. Now, thanks to global warming, you can you can you can do it. It's much further north. Um, but uh, so they hired him to try again, and uh, he went again with a small crew in a small wooden vessel. And in Hudson's Bay in Canada, he um, he was he was very stubborn and kept forging ahead, even though his crew were complaining about frostbite and people were dying and so on. And eventually, the crew mutinied. And they left him and a few uh, of loyal crew members, including his uh, 16-year-old son, on the shallop, the small boat, in the in the middle of the bay. And uh, they sailed back to Europe. So that's where he met his end. You began your remarks about <clears throat> uh, talking about Peter Stuyvesant being at his burial place. I'm dying to know what the mistakes were on the, on his plaque. But can you tell us? Uh, who Peter Stuyvesant was and why is he so important to the story? He was the last director of the colony. Um, so he was in charge of the colony of New Netherland. And the colony, by the way, wasn't just New York and, and you know, the area around Manhattan. It uh, was a whole chunk of uh, the uh, East Coast between the New England colonies to the north and the Virginia colony to the south. So it encompassed all or part of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, and uh, there were a number of different directors in the 40-odd years of its life. And he was the last director. He was the most capable. He was a complicated uh, figure, a complicated man historically. He was always battling with his own people, almost as if he saw them as an enemy. Uh, and, uh, he was, on very, uh, he, he was on very cordial relations with his counterparts in New England, the governors of the New England colonies. He admired them. Uh, the Dutch, um, in the, uh, in the 1600s had, um, fashioned this policy of tolerance of other people, of religious differences, which was very unusual in Europe. In Europe at the time, intolerance was official policy in England, in France, in Spain. And that was just common sense. Everybody believed that if you were going to um, get ahead, if you, as, as a society, you all had to be on the same page. And therefore, the most important and the most divisive thing was religion. So everyone had to be part of uh, the, uh, the state religion. The Dutch went the opposite direction, in part because they had to. There were the low countries. It was easy to to run too easy to invade. So there were people from different backgrounds and they were natural. They were the traders of Europe. And so they spoke different languages. And so they made tolerance of others a, uh, a value. And uh, someone like Stuyvesant didn't like that. He was a, he was the son of a Frisian minister. He was conservative. He was a company man, a dutiful officer of the West India company. He, in his letters with the New England uh, governors, he admired them for their the purity of their of their uh, colonies because they were really all English. And his uh, the famous uh, statistic is that in 1643 there were 18 languages recorded as being spoken in Manhattan. 18 languages when there were only probably about 500 or so people. So he complained that his was his colony was comprised of, as he said, the, the scrapings of all nations. And now what he's complaining about is essentially New York City in its early state. You know, the very thing that people think it is what gives New York its greatness is what he was complaining about. Sounds like there would have been a certain amount of conflict between he and his bosses. Um, how was that eventually resolved? Uh, he was he was always in conflict with his bosses, the the heads of the West India Company, and he was uh, in conflict with his people. But he was, you know, I mean, you can. There are other historians of the colony with whom I've had uh, 
debates from time to time about uh, uh, Stuyvesant and what he was trying to do. And I take their point that he was really in given what he was faced with. Um, he was he was in power for 17 years. He ma- helped to make the the place a success. Uh, he had his faults and his, uh, you know, the, as I say, the very thing that was giving it its strength, he was fighting against. Um, so he had his natural prejudices, but he was um, he was doing remarkable things to hold it together, to hold it together to to try to deal with and make treaties with not just quote the Indians, but all different tribes of the whole region and to understand their alliances and then the English in New England. And again, they were not a block. They were divided into different groups and they had different sort of uh, 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 prejudices and structures within them. And then he had, then there was others, the Swedes in the middle of this period decide they're going to found a colony in North America. And they actually, settle on the Delaware River in what the Dutch had considered to be part of their territory. So there were enormous, it was an enormous sort of 3D chessboard that he had to work with. Who was Peter Minuet and what do we know him best for? He was the second director of the colony. He was one of the first people to come over. Um, He was, we uh, Americans traditionally uh, pronounce his name Minuet as you did. he was um, French background and would have probably pronounced it Minui. And uh, he came over as an assistant, as a, as a scout. Um, and the first director of the colony was a man named Verhulst. And he seems to have been uniquely um, unsuited for the task. And um, the, the settlement pattern, the, the first settlement pattern of the colony was we have to just get as many people as we can dispersed among as wide a territory as we can, because they knew the English were around on the outskirts. And if they didn't have people kind of trying to make farms and hold down a claim, then the English were just going to come in and take it. So they had like, you know, six people in this area and eight people (laughs) in that area. And this is over hundreds and hundreds of square miles. So it was a kind of a crazy, um, uh, way to try to hold your territory, but that was that was the the idea. Um, there were uh, there was a small party of soldiers in the region around what is now Albany, New York, and they violated their orders, which, which uh, always seemed to me uh, I, I relate to the the Star Trek's prime directive, which was don't interfere with the locals and the way they do things. This group of soldiers interfered in a in a dispute between two tribes, the Mahican and the Mohawk, and soldiers were killed in the in the fight between the two groups, and that sent shockwaves among this whole re- throughout the region, and uh, the settlers decided they were going to fire Verhulst as their leader. They picked Peter Minui as their new leader. Minui, then I think, is the one who decides, all right, we have to have a new settlement pattern. We have to have a capital and I'm going to pick this southernmost point of Manhattan Island as the capital. So he then becomes kind of the founder of New Amsterdam, which then, of course, becomes New York City. So that's really um, Minui's claim to fame. He's the one that says, all right, we're going to let's 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 lay out where the fort will go here. We'll lay out streets and this then will become our, our power base. What's the truth behind uh, Peter Minuet paying the, uh, the Native Americans at the time $24 in, uh, in beaver pelts and, and in jewelry? Did he actually do that to purchase, quote unquote, Manhattan Island? Um, there was a there was certainly there, there was a deed at some point. It's been lost. Um, there is a lot to unpack in that Um the, the Dutch believed in paperwork. They believed in legal processes. And uh, so he would have then said to the, the Wikaskek uh, tribe, all right, we want to enter into an agreement with you. Now, the complication here is that the Dutch, the Europeans, had an understanding of property rights and property transfer. 
But the interesting thing is these people who were the Dutch who were um, in the New World, the settlers, understood very well that the native peoples had a different notion of property. They understood that to the natives, it was not something that you could buy and sell and, and that that meant you no longer had ownership of the way you, it might be, you, you might feel about, you know, a, a pot or a book or something. Uh, so the, the agreement that they would have entered into then was something more like a defensive alliance. It would have said, we uh, uh, will, you allow us to live here. We allow you to continue to live here. And in exchange, if you're attacked, we'll help you. And if we're attacked, you'll help us. And to seal the bargain, because that was always uh, important for them, to seal the bargain, we will um, hear a certain amount of goods. And they would have been things like knives and kettles and things that were would have had some you know, utilitarian value to the Wekaskak. Uh, this is in the year 1626, and uh, they send a report back on the next ship to Europe. There is a government official there on the dock, and he then writes a summary of this ship and, and uh, that had just come from the new colony of New Netherland, and he writes to, and this is how we know this information, he writes to his superiors and says, okay, this ship has just returned from the island of Manhattan, our people are there are doing well, uh, women are starting to have children, and they, the first uh, crop of grain is good, and they've on the ship are this many furs that they've sent over, and oh, by the way, they have purchased the island from the natives for what he says is the value of 60 guilders. So first of all, you right away you have this official kind of uh, uh, simplifying that agreement to a purchase, which, as I say, the, the, the people on the ground in New Netherland understood perfectly well that it wasn't a simple purchase. And in fact, the natives stayed throughout the life of the colony. The natives stayed on Manhattan. They come in and out of New Amsterdam and so on. Um, and that, that notion, the value of 60 guilders, then in the 19th century, a uh, translator uh, in America decides to simply tra uh, translate that into current prices and makes that $24. So there you have in a much longer answer than you probably wanted. The, <laughs> I was wondering where you were going. dollar <laughs> purchase. <laughs> that is great. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, what would you say is the lasting impact of the Dutch on American society? tolerance and free trade. Those were the things that the Dutch pioneered that in, in the 17th century that made them stand out from other Europeans. They were things that other Europeans felt were strange when, when uh, uh, English and other travelers went to Dutch cities. They went to Amsterdam. They thought it was strange that there were people of all different backgrounds and skin colors and with turbans and all kinds of things on the streets. This was a time when the people in England were basically English and the people in France were basically French. But in the Dutch cities, they were kind of a melting pot. And that got transferred to this wilderness island called Manhattan, along with this policy, an official policy of tolerance that's, that said, this is OK. And the other thing, they pioneered these notions of free trade, the, the rudiments of capitalism. And those things, too, got transferred to this island called Manhattan. And they put the, the perimeter of that island, the northern boundary, they built a defensive wall. And the street that ran along that was called Wall Street. So and, and it's not co a coincidence that Wall Street then becomes synonymous with the American financial district and, and, and finance in general. So those two things, if you think about it, define really and are, are, are kind of the ingredients for New York City. But beyond that, because in the 19th century, when great waves of immigrants came from Europe to America, because they landed, first of all, in Manhattan, they looked around them and saw what was then this teeming city of people of different backgrounds, worshiping different faiths and struggling to get along and doing this thing that we would call, I guess, upward mobility. They said, oh, this is America. It wasn't America yet. 
it was New York. And it was New York because it had been in New Amsterdam. But many of those people, as they moved west, they took that idea with them. And so that's how the roots that, though, that were planted by those Dutch settlers got spread broadly throughout America. That's a great story. You know, I here we are. We're, we've run out of time. I wish we could go on for who knows how much longer. But uh, I just want to thank you very much, uh, Russell, for being a guest on Talking Heart Island. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Hi, this is Norma Jean. I wanted to take a moment to remind you, in order to receive updates or news about upcoming episodes of Talking Heart Island, simply go to the subscribe page on our website, located at www.michaeltkeen.com, and enter your email address. If you have any questions about the podcast itself or simply wish to contact any team members for book inquiries, voiceovers, website or graphics design, use our contact page, also found at www.michaeltkeen.com. And if you're enjoying the show and would like to give us a review, please do so at iTunes. We would greatly appreciate it. So until next week, this is Norma Jean, and we're Talking Heart Island. Music.